Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your faithfulness. You never leave us nor forsake us. You are good. You are holy. You're eternally good and faithful and holy. Oh, praise you, Lord. Let your word sink deep into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, statistically, Stanford University ranks as one of the toughest schools to give an acceptance letter. The university recently updated their admission standards and stated that only 5% of the applying students are accepted. 5%. In 2017, 42,497 students applied and 2,140 were accepted. On their website, they gave student realistic answers for their questions. What is the academic standard to be accepted into Stanford? An ACT score of 33 will put you in the top 50% of applicants. Top 50%. However, the average score for acceptance is an ATC score of 35. 36 is a perfect score. I don't even know. I, I think I got 21 on. Yeah, I didn't do too well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Accepted students will also need an average. If they don't do the ACT, then they could do the SAT, and their score would have to be 1520 or higher. That's out of 1600. The average GPA of 4.18, I didn't get this, out of 4.0. I didn't understand that one. Plus a robust resume of extracurricular activities, leadership qualities, references, and recommendations. Of course, new students also have to pay the Stanford have to pay Stanford per year at sixty thousand dollars. So that's times four, two hundred and forty thousand dollars. In conclusion, if you want to get into Stanford, you better be close to perfect. The standard, to get into the standard to get into Stanford is incredibly high, and the ability to reach that level is difficult to some and impossible for others. Very few get in, as it was mentioned, only 5%. But those high school graduates who get into Stanford may be close to perfection in academics and leadership, but are they morally perfect? Are they morally good? Perfection. What does that even mean? Never wrong? Never having failed? Never reacting negatively. You know, I thought I was uh, wrong, but I was mistaken. Right? <laughs> Old joke there. No, I've been mar wrong many times. Scripture speaks about perfection, though. In Deuteronomy, we're told that God is perfect. In Deuteronomy 32, it says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. God's work is perfect. His ways are just. In Leviticus, we're told that the animal has to, that is to be sacrificed has to be perfect, meaning it can't have any blemishes or problems, uh, injuries or handicap. We're told in Psalm 19 that the law is perfect. Beauty is perfected in the presence of God, Psalm 50. In Isaiah 25, it says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. Perfection is defined as faithfulness, coming through, not failing, able to complete the desired effect. God comes through. We're told in Ezekiel that the temple is a perfect square, all sized down to the micrometer, all the same. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 5, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a pretty tall standard. James wrote, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. We stumble and we stumble many ways. We are promised in 1 Peter, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. God will perfect you. He will establish you. He will confirm. He will strengthen in 1 John, it says, But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. God has, is perfecting his love in us. God's love, I believe, is the definition of perfect and being perfect. His love is what is perfecting you. His love is the pinnacle of perfection. 1 John, again, says, No one has seen God at any time if we love another. God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this love, 
By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. His love is perfecting us. His love is the the standard of perfection. Although no one has seen God, as it's mentioned there in 1 John, he has seen him face to face. When his love is shining through us, as we are loving each other, God is seen to this world. We are expressing to the world who God is. And God is made known. Love is the way perfection is defined. Let us pursue perfection by pursuing love. You know, Jesus said, we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. This is the definition of perfection. When we think of the word success, how is it defined in our culture? Love is really not the means by which success is measured, at least not the one that I normally see. Holiness is not discussed, and your relationship with God is not mentioned. When we think of success, it's really about how well a person does in business or in the field of what they're working on, amount of work they produce, the amount of money maybe they make, the fame that this person has, maybe their confidence. We may throw in words like humility and integrity and character, but they don't seem to be the forefront of success, you know. When you think of success, though, in the terms of Christ, it's contrary to that way the world defines it. In Mark 9, the disciples were discussing among themselves who was better. Could you imagine that discussion, listening to that? Well, I think I'm better than you, Thomas. I mean, you hardly ever show up in Scripture, you know. And when you do, you doubt, you know. I mean, and they're here, they're fighting with each other. And then Jesus says, well, guys, what are you talking about? And they don't say a word. They're like, you know. And then he pulls the car over. And in Mark 9, it says, sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. In Mark 10, the Lord Jesus said, permit the children to come to me, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter into it at all. So he takes a child and says, you want to be great? Here is your standard of greatness. Now, John Ortberg, uh, in his book, Who Is This Man?, tells us how children were viewed at, in Jesus' time. The title child, especially in that day, Jesus' day, would be a vivid contrast with king or great. In the ancient status-ordered world, children were at the bottom of the ladder. In both Greek and Latin, the words for children meant not speaking. Children lacked the dignity of reason. Plato wrote about the mob of motley appetites, pains, and pleasures one would find in children, along with slaves and women. Children are noted for fear, weakness, and helplessness. Certainly not the standard and the qualities you want to have. You want success, says Jesus? You pick the lowest position on earth, and that is success in the kingdom of God. Loving others puts you in that position. Serving one another, lifting them up, not thinking of yourself, but thinking of others. Loving God as he loves you and seeking to serve and build up as he has loved you and served you. So I challenge challenge you today, pursue success, pursue love. Pursue love. You know, as we continue our study of Romans, we see that Paul is saying the same thing in these chapters. That our definition of love has to be changed from what culture and society dictates to what Christ is saying. What is Christ saying? How is he speaking it? How is he teaching us? We have to have the childlike mind, not the childish mind, but the childlike mind and the childlike attitude and seek to serve and not be served. He is challenging our humanity and our efforts He's challenging our very understanding of what it means to be human and how society has demonstrated what that means and what God has called it to mean. You know, Paul in his letter to the Romans, Paul talks, mostly, most, talks most specifically about the gospel and the human heart. And he starts off with the human heart. He talks about who we are and how we look at life. In order for the gospel to be heard and understood, you have to come to a place to see who you are, how God sees you. He, ha- he has to show you who you are. You're a sinner. And he does not pull any punches. I mean, he shows it as vivid as possible. If you're a Gentile 
you see the immorality of your heart and your actions. If you're a Jewish person or a religious person, you see the self-righteousness and the judgmental attitude in your heart and actions. In, Paul, in chapter 1, Paul exposed the heart of immoral behavior, sexual promiscuity, homosexuality, deviancy, debauchery, selfishness, unloving, unmerciful, greedy, boastful, arrogant, and inventors of evil. And, of course, he has a long list. In chapter 2, Paul exposed the religious heart that is filled with self-righteousness, that is um, unloving, unmerciful, boastful, arrogant, inventors of false righteousness, deviant, debauchery, and, that, and all those uh, self-righteous way. The self-righteous plead for God's justice, and they say, don't want your grace, we want your justice to be poured out on all these horrible, evil people. Self-righteousness. Paul reminds religious-minded person that God will render to each person according to his deeds, and no one is exempt from his judgment. Whether you think you're worth it, he's saying no one's worth, no one is worthy to stand in God's presence. God is not partial, but rather he will judge all sin and all sinners. He, as he's writing this, he's telling the church to approach the holy God. When you approach him, you better come humbly and you better come with a repentant heart. Not saying, I have rights, Lord. I have all my rights. You better accept me. I have my card. He wants repentance. He wants humility. So pursue love, not rights. Number one, Where's your confidence? Let's look at chapter 2, verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having it in the law and the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. Of course, he continues on. I think it's like, if you look in Greek, it's like one long sentence, you know. <laughs> in the novel Girlfriend in a Coma, Douglas Coupland uh, tells a story of a lady named Karen who in 1979 falls into a coma. And while she lies in the hospital, life goes on, and her teenage friends grow up, get married, get divorced, get do drugs. And in her vegetative state, Karen misses the fall of the Berlin Wall, the AIDS crisis, the ubiquitous uh, personal computer. And 17 years later, after collapsing, Karen wakes up. 1996. Her sudden reawakening is a huge story. And Karen initially sort of um, resists the media hype, and, but eventually she sits down and does an interview with a local TV reporter named Gloria. And the big question is just how, I, 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 how is Karen finding the world from today? What does she see today? What is she, she's awakened to a different world. What does she see? And so Gloria asks, what is the biggest change in the world you've noticed so far, Karen? What strikes you as the deepest change? And Karen says, you know what it is, Gloria? It's how confident everybody comes across these days. Everybody looks like they're raring to go all the time. People look confident when they're buying chewing gum or walking the dog. You like that then? Well, there's more. You take the same confident-looking people and ask them a few questions, and suddenly you realize that they're despairing about the world, that the confidence is a mask. What kind of questions are you talking about? What do you think life will be like in 10 years, she says. Are you straining to find some kind of meaning? Does growing old frighten you? Hmm. We're a culture searching for meaning. Where does our confidence lie? Is our confidence in our education, the talents we have, the knowledge we've attained, the health that we're blessed with, the experience we've endured, the family we have, the money we make, the reputation we've gained, the leadership abilities? As people, we're capable of many good things. We have relatively safe communities. We have a great understanding of medicine and medical technology, so if we fall ill, we're confident in going to the doctor. We have good standard of living. We don't look at our town and hope, well, I hope no one invades it next year. I mean, we don't think that way. We don't think there's an army from the east coming to destroy Evanston. We just don't have that mindset. We don't have that threat. We do have struggles. We have struggles with ideas, inflation, the pandemic, the ongoing divisive political fighting, the rising crime in most major cities, the economy. You know, we have a, what's called a consumer confident index to determine how confident people are in the, in the economy. But what is confidence? If you were to ask you, what would confidence mean? Is it certainty, stability, faithfulness, knowledge? When Paul sees the Jewish person and leaders, he wants them to see themselves correctly. When we say correctly, how does God see you? How does God see you? 
That was God see us. So he says, you, hear, you bear the name Jew. What are you relying on? You're relying on the name? Are you relying on your ethnicity? Are you relying on your genealogy? Number one, rely on God's faithfulness. The Jewish person were given the greatest of all things. They were given the specific revelation of God as he appeared to them and gave them his word, as he gave them the Ten Commandments, as he gave them the law, as he told them how to build a tabernacle. What is that tabernacle? The tabernacle is God's presence in the midst of his people. The Jews were blessed by God so abundantly. We today enjoy the benefits of what God gave the Jewish people when we read his word, when we read God's word. They have the law. The righteousness of God was clearly spelled out. They boasted in God. They knew God's will as they had the law. They were confident in telling the blind what is wrong with the world. And they were light to the world as they, were shy, as they knew the law of God and his righteousness. They were able through the law to correct what is foolish and to teach the immature how to gain maturity. But the problem was not so much in what they had, but what they did with it. Romans 9, if you want to come with me, kind of shows how they took what, they gave, what God gave them. In, in Romans 9, uh, 31 and 32, it says, But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. They attempted it to fulfill it on their own. The Jewish people were confident in what God gave them, that they saw it as an entitlement instead of a lifestyle to be lived, instead of grace. You know, but even when it was lived out in their lives, it was lived out self-righteously. The Jewish people became prideful, especially the religious leaders, because we have this knowledge, we're better people than you. God spoke to us, he didn't speak to you, therefore we're better people than you. We have light, you have darkness, we have wisdom, you have foolishness. We're mature. You're immature. We are better than you. The problem is that since God has given his revelation to the, his people, it does not make them better. It makes them responsible. And the same is true with us. We are given the gospel message. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He forgives you of your sins because Christ died on the cross. And he rose again. Does that make you a better person, better than someone else? My life is more important than your life? No, it makes me responsible to make sure people hear that and know that and to live it out so people will hear the gospel message and know the gospel message. My life isn't more important than yours. I am blessed, obviously, to know the gospel. It makes me responsible, though. You know, selfishness is rather insidious. I can be selfish and immoral taking from people what I want that will please me, and I can be selfish and self-righteousness because when I'm self-righteous, I'm still thinking about me. I'm still looking at me, pridefully thinking I'm better. But either way, I'm selfishly thinking of myself. My confidence does not reside in me, but it's supposed to reside in God who created me. He gave me the gospel, his word, and his son. I wasn't, um, I didn't earn this gospel. I didn't uh, say, look, I'm better than this person, therefore I get it. No, I was given it through his grace. To the Jews, he's saying, don't be confident in yourself or in the name or in your genealogy, but in the God who gave you his word, who created you, who gave you Christ. Be confident in God and his faithfulness. What the Jewish people have is because God gave it. They did not earn it, but because they're Jewish and are called God's people, a sense of entitlement began to grow, and expectation was born. This is why when God, Christ went to Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. He says, how can I enter my mother's womb again? Because that made sense to him. If I'm born a Jew, I'm in. I'm in God's good graces. And, he, and Jesus said, no. <laughs> if you're born again, you're in. No person is sovereign. God is sovereign. God expects humility as you approach him. He expects for you to love and not seek, and not just seek to be loved only by this world, but to love and to love in the midst when you're being attacked and to keep loving. He expects you to repent. He expects you to recognize your sins and then receive his grace. Pursue success by pursuing love. Number two, how is your lifestyle? 
So Paul continues on in verse 20. He says, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having the law, the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? Uh, you who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through the break, though you are breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of the God is blaspheming among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Mark Deaver, who pastors a church among the rich and powerful people of Washington, D.C., shares about how he and his wife will walk their dog around Congressional Cemetery on Capitol Hill. And they'll, they'll often pass by the names of many people who were quite important decades ago during their lives, but now those names are largely meaningless to probably us today. Who are they? We don't know. Reflecting on these once powerful people, Deaver writes, but you know what matters most now and forever is this. Were they forgiven? Whether they were in Congress for one term or five, were they forgiven? He then he shares the following story from his friend Don Carson. Carson was writing movingly about the death of his father. He says, when dad died, there were no crowds outside the hospital, no notice in the papers, no announcements on the TV, no mention in the parliament, no notice in the nation. In his hospital room, there was only the quiet hiss of oxygen, vainly venting because dad had stopped breathing and would never need it again. But on the other side, all the trumpets sounded. Da dad won admittance to the only throne room that matters, not because he was a good man or a great man, but because he was a forgiven man. When we think of ability, we think of what we're capable of doing. What are you capable of doing? What is any of us capable of doing? We're capable of many great things, of good things. We're capable of creating, fixing, repairing, building, artistry, poetry, engineering, studying, observing, helping. We can use our hands to write a novel, paint a masterpiece, hold up a child, hold a hand, care for someone. And we can also use our hands to hit, strike, write something that will only vilify and hurt, destroy, and even kill. Our minds can use reason and logic. Our minds can read, think, create. Our minds can dwell on the past, the hurts, and plan for revenge and conflict. Our feet can carry us towards someone who's hurting, or they can take us far away, saying, I'll never talk to that person again. Our tongues can be used to speak words of healing and grace, or it can be, they can be wor used for words of hurting and cursing. We're capable of such wonderful beauty, but also of such dark acts. We were created in the image of God. We were created to reveal and live out the love of God that he has given to us. Number one, God is our ability. So Paul looks at the Jewish person who has been given so much by God. What has the Jewish person done with what they've been given? What have we done with what God has given to us? When I say God is our ability, it means he is our strength because we are weak. We can be told what to do, but are unable to do really do what he wants us to do because we don't have the power to do it. Paul, in these verses, gives back a fourth rapid-fire uh, questions and answers to expose the hypocrisy of our own efforts. Hypocrisy is not accepting our inability, but trying to cover up our inability with our phoniness. The Jewish person has been given the law, but are they teaching the law? So they will learn or teaching the law so they can feel good about themselves. What are they t teaching the law for? Is it for themselves? So that I can look good? First Timothy, we read this. But we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers for murders. And it continues on. The law is to expose us of our sin. In fact, uh, Ray Comfort uses that in his evangelism myth. He says, have you ever told a lie? <laughs> have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever lusted? And you went, oh, no. <laughs> well, you just told God you're a liar, thief, and adulterer. <laughs> How are you going to stand in his presence? Oh, well, you got nothing. It, the law is used to express to show and reveal our sin. It reveals our inability. If you look at how the law was given to the people in Exodus through Deuteronomy, God gives his law, then they break the law. He gives more law, they break the law. He gives more law, they break the law. It's just a continual pattern. They continually break the law and follow after their own, their own heart. The law reveals the sin in your heart. It cannot make you righteous. The law is a standard of righteousness, but we or anyone else is unable to live up to it. 
So Paul asked the question, do you teach yourself? No, because you treat the law as if you can accomplish it. Do you teach the people not to steal, but then you steal? Do you teach people to not commit adultery, but then you commit adultery? You remember in uh, Matthew 5, it says very clearly, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart, you've already sinned. (laughs) Do you abhor idols, but rob temples? This is an interesting verse here, because it doesn't necessarily mean they're going in to steal an idol, but rather they're being they're committing sacrilege like this temple that has false false gods. I am living a lie contrary to God's law, so I am like worshiping an idol, contrary to God's word. I'm committing sacrilege against the one true God and, and how I live and act. They're not different than the temples honoring a false god. We can do that too. We can look down on idolatry, but then we act as if we are not worshiping God. A Jewish person boasts in the law, but break the law. That is the sacrilege. They instead dishonor God because the law is a standard that cannot be reached. It cannot be attained by human effort. We need help. That is why we're unsuccessful in becoming successful. So we change the definition of successful. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, in Jesus' day, that was a shocking statement. And the disciples go, well, who then can be saved? Because if you were rich and wealthy and healthy and wise, that means God's blessing you and you're in. And so the disciples says, well, then who can be saved? doesn't make sense. And so Jesus replied, with people it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. It's impossible for us to be saved, but not with God. He can make it happen. Now, when Jewish people were given the law, it did not change them. It exposed them, as it does us. In the book of James, we read, For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. If you break one law, you broke it all. Oh, I got all nine. I did nine real well. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. God doesn't grade on a curve. You know, you got nine out of ten. That's too bad. <laughs> no, it's pass or fail. <laughs> instead, Paul points out that while God gave the Jews his word, instead of making God known to the world all of his beauty, they blasphemed God. As he was quoting from the book of uh, Isaiah, I believe, and, and Proverbs. Um, or he's quoting from Ezekiel in Isaiah, that is, of saying that you have blasphemed my name among the de- Gentiles. You, you've blasphemed my name. You haven't honored my name. When they look at you, they don't see me. They see themselves. And so, and so he says, shouldn't that be a wake-up call when you read that verse? If they failed, what makes me think I'll do better? But somehow we think that. Well, they failed. I'll learn from them and I'll just do a little better job. If they failed, <laughs> doesn't mean I will. I'll, 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 I'll be better. You know, when we read the law, when we read the Old Testament, maybe God wants another way. Maybe he wants to do something different. Maybe God wanted to use the law to show us that we need help. We need a Savior. Instead of trying to distinguish myself from other people saying I'm better than you, why don't I accept the fact that we're all the sinner? We're all sinners. And we all need Jesus. And we all need his grace. And he died for you as he died for me. So I'm going to pursue that love. Number three, what are you able to do? Verse 25. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirement of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are transgressor of the law? For he's not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he who is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Now, there are three things that were essential to the Jewish world at the time of this, uh, you know, in, in this first century that really distinguish you. And it was sort of like, these are the big three. Are you following the Sabbath day? Are you circumcised? Are you following the food laws? 
And, and of course, some of those other things would fall into place to the other laws. In Acts 13 and 14, Paul, along with Barnabas, went around uh, the world or the Europe and, and Asia and those types, not everywhere, but certain places, Cyprus and Galatia to be specific, and they planted churches. And what they would do is they would go to the Jewish synagogue and they would preach the gospel message because they knew the word of God. And then if there were a Jewish man that would become saved, who would bow their knee to Christ, who would accept Christ as the Messiah, he would make them leaders of the church plant. Then he would go to the Gentiles, tell them about Christ, and put them under the leadership of this Jewish elder because the Jewish elder would know scripture. And he could then teach these Gentiles about Christ and the word of God. That was his method. It made sense. These guys know scripture. Let them teach. Well, and that worked well. But then a problem arose. It appears in Acts 15. Acts 15, 1. It says, Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brethren, Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, basically what he's saying is, Unless you become a Jew first, you cannot be saved. Unless you follow the law, you cannot be saved. Well, we can't. That's why we need Christ. This became quite a contentious argument that caused a lot of problems. And even though it was resolved in Acts 15, it was never fully resolved by some of the Jewish thinkers. And it continued to cause problems. And this is a problem that Paul continually ran into. And one of the reasons why he wrote this letter to show, I am not contrary to the law or the word of God. I'm teaching the gospel as it has been seen plainly throughout Scripture. Paul knew that the gospel message is a supernatural message requiring supernatural work. It is the Spirit's job to bring you in righteousness. It is not you and the laws and your ability to obey the law. So number one, the gospel requires a new heart. As Paul looks at the Jew and Gentile, he recognizes they're the same. If you're a Jew and heard that, you would be offended. What? I'm the same as a Gentile? Are you kidding me? You're calling me on the same level as a Gentile? Those immoral, evil people? Yeah. You're a sinner too. A Jewish man is circumcised and a Gentile man may not be. This circumcision was what God demanded of Abraham and all his male descendants after him. It was a sign of the covenant. It was expected by the Jews. But Paul is saying, if you're circumcised, in what way has your life changed? Are you, are you righteous? Are you living out holiness? There were many who were circumcised who did not obey God, who worshipped idols and pursued God. If you break the law but are circumcised, will that circumcision, that religious tradition, keep you from the wrath of God? Sometimes people say, well, I was baptized, therefore I'm waving my baptism card in front of God's face. I'm in. And God says, is there a changed life? Is there a renewed life? Is there a righteous desire? Is there a, a desire to honor God and live the life of Christ? Or are you just using your baptism to, as an excuse to do whatever you want to do? It's a new heart. We can do all sorts of religious traditions. You know, today we're going to celebrate communion. And, you know, we can sit there and say, well, I celebrate communion. Is there a changed heart? Is there a changed life? Is there a, a, a love for God and a love for others? Or are you using it as an excuse just to do whatever you want to do? Because if you want an excuse, you can come up with them any. Or do you really want to know God and live for him? And that's what he's saying here. He says, are you saying that just because you're circumcised and you're part of the covenant that you're in? Remember, you've got to be born again. In 2 Corinthians 3, it says, Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And really, in order for us to understand the Christian life, it is a supernatural, Spirit-filled life. It is not a human endeavor. It is a supernatural, Spirit-filled life. It has to be the Holy Spirit. Or you're not going to, it's not going to happen. And so we call upon the Holy Spirit, please, God, I need you. I need your strength. Are you trying so hard when all you have to do is surrender to Christ, confessing and repenting and receiving? When you finally surrender to Christ is when you truly find freedom. You find hope, success, and salvation. Receive a new heart. Receive Christ. Pursue success. 
pursue us.